Greetings. This lecture is on the Great Depression in Canada. Decisions made in Washington had a major impact on the Canadian economy. The protectionism of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff of 1930, signed by President Herbert Hoover, pretty much spelled disaster for Canada. Even if many were unaware of how bad the tariff was for people on both sides of the border, Canada was particularly vulnerable because it depended on the American market. By 1929, about 40% of all Canadian exports went to the United States. The economic well being of Canada was closely tied to the soundness of the American economy. Closely matching the American experience, the Canadian economy struggled from late 1929 to 1933, followed by years of poor economic performance. And this lasted until World War II. In fact, in 1937, there was a severe recession. So very much like the American experience where the Great Depression just persisted, continued year after year after year. The United States was the only country that suffered more than Canada. In constant dollars, the gross national product of Canada dropped by two fifths in the years 1929 to 1933. The national economy in 1933 was about one half of what it was four years earlier. The volume of imports was down about 57% and exports 25%. Unemployment reached a record high of 20%. Many nations adopted the American policy of tariffs. Britain, Canada, and others turned to protect their own private national interests. The British abandonment of their long standing policy of free trade was notable. The economic warfare of high tariffs was a terrible blow for the, for the Canadian economy, which depended heavily on the export of raw and semi-processed goods. Saskatchewan farmers were hit hard. They were hit hard with the restricted trade practices of other countries, drought, and grasshoppers. In fact, Saskatchewan and the other Canadian Prairie provinces experienced 10 years of exceptional and persistent drought and grass, grasshopper infestation, infestations. Topsoil turned to dust and strong winds blew it away. The total Saskatchewan income was about one quarter what it was in 1928. With a limited market and lower demand, the value of wheat plummeted. Canadian wheat prices dropped from $1.29 to 34 cents a bushel. And this was for the best wheat on the market. Lesser quality wheat sold for even less. With fewer wheat sales, the railways suffered. A, di a, a domino effect was obvious. Southern Ontario and Quebec companies that manufactured capital goods such as tractors or boxcars had far fewer sales. Without the sales, companies had to lower production and lay off workers. With declining productivity, iron and steel industries were hurt. 
Less activity in the iron and steel companies meant less need for coal, which added to the troubles of the coal industry, notably in Cape Britain, Nova Scotia, where there were few other employment opportunities for workers. High unemployment meant a drop in non-residential construction, which in turn hurt the lumber producers. So the domino effect continued with damaging consequences for retailers and for the service industries generally. Additional American duties on lumber and copper in 1932 worsened conditions in Canada. The political response varied. Some politicians were wary of any untested economic ideas. Others were in an almost state of panic, willing to give the government more power. When the crash hit, the, Liber the Liberal Party was in power, led by Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King, the most educated prime minister in Canadian history, King expected that the depression was just another temporary dip in the economy. Neither King nor R.B. Bennett, who was the leader of the opposition, that is the leader of the Conservative Party, neither King nor R.B. Bennett proposed any sweeping economic reform. In 1930, King made a political blunder when he announced his refusal to give any assistance to a provincial government that did not support his policies. Come election time in 1930, R.B. Bennett promised that if elected, he would solve the economic problems of the nation. The election saw the Conservatives win 134 seats to the Liberals 90. And here we see in those blocks, the blue box represent the Tory, the Tory blue. And the red, of course, is the Liberals. So there was a split of 134 to 90 seats. Actually, the popular vote was much closer. The Tories had 48% and the Liberals had 46%. And the remaining numbers to get your 100 were smaller uh, parties, third, third parties. Prime Minister Bennett's intervention in the economy did not go well. Like President Hoover, he introduced a high tariff policy. But Canada, as stated earlier, depended on the exports of staples. Canada needed to sell its wheat, pulp and paper, and minerals. The amount of revenue collected by governments was not enough. And there was a crisis in public finance and the four Western provinces faced the issue of insolvency. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, British Columbia dodged the bullet, but Alberta defaulted on its debts. One interesting development was the emergence of new political parties, for example, popular radio preacher, William Aberhart, began a social credit political party. This was a, uh, <clears throat> the social credit had its origins in British, in Britain. And he adopted it for Alberta, his version of it, at Aberhart. In 1935, the social credit won the Alberta election. Premier Eberhardt adopted new economic ideas, including giving all Albertans money. And this was in the form of dividends 
to each person. But his economic ideas were declared unconstitutional and the federal government disallowed the social credit legislation. And in this cartoon, you can see the Saskatchewan farmer and he's pumping in the air sound policies trying to neutralize uh, this, uh, what he, what Saskatchewan and, and actually the federal, federal government considered was unsound po policies. And you can see the, the flag there in the background with uh, $25 a month. Well, the severity of unemployment varied unevenly in different Canadian regions, but all provinces struggled and provincial leaders looked to the federal government for assistance. The workers who continued to fare the worst were those employed in the export oriented areas, those regions where exports were, were key. And so this would include Atlantic fishermen, Cape Britain and British Columbia slash Alberta border, border coal miners. So right there, you have the coal industry in Cape Britain, Nova Scotia, and also you have the, the uh, coal uh, operations right there on the border of British Columbia and Alberta. So coal mining there. And also you have uh, forest workers, not only in British Columbia, but also Quebec and Ontario. So all these areas were uh, fared pretty badly because of not being able to, you know, sell these, uh, you know, these key exports, these key uh, commodities. So those working in construction and transportation, of course, they also would suffer. And, and again, I make that point about the domino effect, how you have, uh, you know, one industry hurting it by itself has a trickle effect on, on other, uh, other industry, industries. Okay, let's look at the, the, the retail business, in the retail business and also the financial sector and service industry. We, we have these industries hurt, uh, not as much as some of the export areas, but you know, still, if people did not lose their jobs in the you know, retail business or service industry, certainly they, their incomes were, were decreased. They were lower incomes. Civil servants and teachers, for the most uh, most part continued to work, but they were, they too received a smaller income. The, you know, the school the education has to continue, and so for teachers, uh, most of them kept their jobs. And civil servants, those working in the government, well, they got to keep their jobs too. White collar workers fared better than blue collar workers, as did skilled workers compared to the unskilled. So people who had skills are going to fare much better than those who were unskilled when it came down to, you know, finding employment and keeping it. Interesting, uh, women, because women typically earn less than men, they were sometimes less vulnerable when it came to company layoffs. So if uh, a female worker can, is doing the work, is in a sector where, she, where she's doing the work, equal work to, to men, well, because she's getting paid less, the, often we have cases where the men would be, would be laid off and so there would be savings there because the women, again, are not paid the same as men. To no surprise, university enrollment gradually rose in this era of fewer good paying jobs and career opportunities. And the slide there is a university that I went to, uh, this is a historic uh, 
uh, aerial photograph of Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. So an increasing number of younger people, young people opted for education rather than pursuing employment in these difficult economic times. Now, the numbers who went to university, there's nowhere near the surge one sees in later decades, particular beginning in the 1960s, you know, related to the baby boom. But there, there were, you know, uh, uh, a, an increase in number of students going to, to universities. Well, for those, for the many who failed to find unemployment, one option was going on the POGI. Now, this was a term designating relief assistance. And we have two types of relief. We have indirect and direct. Indirect relief involved working on government finance projects, quote, designed specifically to relieve unemployment with direct relief, the recipient did not necessarily do anything to earn their income. The relief system was flawed in the sense that direct relief in the form of cash or vouchers for goods was cheaper for the government than indirect relief projects, which required more planning and administration. There were reports that the hated POGI led to a sal salon relief mentality. The process of receiving relief was not easy. People lined up in a church basement or fire hall waiting for relief. When asked, quote, they had to proclaim their destitution and swear that they did not own a car radio or a telephone. If they qualified for relief, they received food vouchers to purchase the minimum necessities at local, at local stores. And in this slide, we, we see vacancy for roamers, relief vouchers accepted. To avoid drifters from other regions, many municipalities had lengthy residential requirements. In some cases, people demanded additional assistance. And I have one report here from, a from 1930, quote, I have seen men who come into the office with tears in their eyes, suffering humiliation at being forced to apply for assistance. And today, the very same men are demanding increases in relief and adopting the attitude that it's their inalienable right to receive relief. So these uh, engagements, you know, when you have uh, men, unemployed men, and they are seeking relief and, and they're, they're getting this relief and there's, there's contact between them and the administrators um, it certainly there can be, you know, emotions can be high in how this all takes place. Now, uh, concerned about the wonder, wandering unemployed and wanting to maintain control, the federal government created relief camps. So to prevent rebellion, Prominent social worker Charlotte Witten worked with army officials to establish federal relief camps. The camps were set up in numerous isolated locations across the country. So they didn't want to have these camps anywhere near cities. So they were in isolated locations. And we, we see that they, they first were set up in 1932. And over a four year period, approximately 100,000 single men worked menial jobs designed to keep them busy. 
their pay was 20 cents a day. Yes, 20 cents a day. Now, some of the work made little economic sense in that tax tasks were carried out using non-mechanical tools and equipment. And the point here was to keep people busy rather than be efficient. And I have, I have read an, an account where there was a case on one day, the men were tasked to dig holes and the following day, or sorry, the following day, yes, following the day, they, they went back and they filled the holes back in. So uh, rather somewhat insane, but the idea was to keep, keep busy, people busy. It wasn't about wealth creation, it wasn't about being efficient or effective, it was just to keep people, young people, mostly out of trouble. There was significant commentary on how the government should respond to the dire economic conditions. Even some church leaders commented on issues such as relief and public works programs. And here I draw on some of my research where I looked at the magazine, The Maritime Baptist, and I read through uh, numerous copies of the Maritime Baptist, which was the Baptist denomination magazine in the Maritime provinces. That would be Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. And I found a, a mix of interpretations and commentary on the Great Depression. So there was a mix of traditional and radical interpretations from this church community. So for example, in the Maritime Baptist, Roger Babson discouraged direct relief to the poor since this undermined the character of the recipient. He also argued that public works programs were dangerous. Only if more men and women took business risks and thus generating better distribution and consumption of goods would the economy improve. This is what something that Babson argued. So he, he is taking a more traditional laissez-faire economic approach to turning the depression, you know, turning things around. Concerning slum housing, there was a Reverend Dr. Bryce Knott of Central Baptist Church in St. John. He was disapproving of those who resigned themselves to live in a shabby house or to accept relief assistance. While Reverend W. Alvin Robbins recognized the seriousness of the depression, he wrote that on the issue of revival of religion, hard times may be the best thing for us now. In other words, difficult times would encourage people to return to God and trust his direction. President R.B. Wallace of the Baptist Convention argued that industrial strikes were mainly initiated by foreign agitators who did not suffer the hardships that strikers experienced. In a November 1936 issue of the Maritime Baptist, there was an H.V. Hoff who asserted work, uh, he wanted workers to deny, to deny the notion of business people in conflict with labor. And he argued, Hoff argued that such a structure was false. You know, the class conflict interpretation was false. Exalting the virtues of individualism and industrial technology, Hoff asserted that machines increased consumption and employment. He believed it was time to, and, he, and others taking a more traditional interpretation economic approach argued 
that it was time to harness the creativity and entrepreneurial spirit of people and not be mired in a spirit of doom, gloom, and rebellion. So that was a little more traditional understanding and assessments. Now we take a look at some of the more radical assessments. So some Bap maritime Baptist leaders viewed the existing capitalist order as evil. For example, in February 1931, United Baptist Reverend Neil Herman of Moncton wrote that the whole heart-rending episode of modern industrialism is so glaring, so penetrating, that to claim our economic system as being Christian would be so preposterous as to make angels weep and heathens laugh. The Maritime Baptist even printed articles depicting the hardships of the Great Depression in America as told by one correspondent. So the following wing was uh, published in the Maritime Baptist. I live by work. The ground I work on does not belong to me. The tools I work with are the property of the boss. The fruits of my toil belong to others. I have nothing to sell but labor. The only thing that stands between me and poverty is my job. But even my job is not mine in the sense that it is my property to sell, barter, or to use, or dispose of at my will. And yet my job is all that separates me from the social outcasts. My job is more than that. My job is my bread and butter, my salt and meat, my clothes and shelter, my bodily comfort, my soul salvation for jobless men rot in body and soul. And quote. Well, we can see the you know the the, the emotions here in um, people dealing with uh, with poverty, and this was something that was not uncommon in the Maritime Baptist magazine. And these these words were again were published in uh, about mid nineteen thirty one. There is a, a, a social message of conflict that we can find. Uh, some, some clergymen believe that free market capitalism was a failure. Certainly there were a growing number of intellectuals and commentators who looked to the socialism, socialism elsewhere as a better model for economic prosperity. In the same year, Reverend Neil Herman asked, is our civilization Christian? Discussing the industrial system, Herman was amazed with the capabilities of the modern industrial machine, while at the same time concerned about the spiritual basis of those who own the machines. And his assessment was bleak. We are dumbfounded to discover that the modern mogul of wealth can, without batting an eyelash, make millions of dollars and also throw many people out, out of work from the simple act of updating industrial machinery. Behind this business morality that allowed the control of wealth by a small percent of the population was the mad rush for markets, regardless of flesh and blood, without respect to God. End of quote. So again, the language is quite, uh, you know, socialistic, quite uh, um, a sense of militancy we see here. In February 1933, Maritime Baptist editor the Reverend Gordon Warren condemned the blind and cruel greed of the existing industrial, financial, and economic order. In another editorial on the issue of evangelization, Warren maintained that Christ had been denied in this social order that allowed the inequality of some living sumptuously while many others had been compelled to join the bread line. The Reverend C.A. Charter of Dawson, New Brunswick discussed many provisions for the needy and unemployment and sweeping away of class distinctions. But his solution, like others, was vague. Clergy 
promoting a socialist assessment during the Great Depression presented passionate statements, but they showed little evidence of understanding basic economics. There were no clear arguments on how a social government would take control and improve the economy. Some who believed that the church should arouse public opinion against capitalism and compel the government to legislate a more just social order explained that the economic answer was the teaching of uh, teaching was was um, teaching of Christ. So Christ's teachings, which some believe embrace socialism. In the 1934 report on the Social Service Board, the Baptist Convention showed his support for social legislation. One of the more forceful speakers for radical reform was the Reverend Ross Eaton. For him, government relief measures were inadequate when what was needed was more was an, some form of socialism. In another article entitled Wanted, a program of social action, Eaton stated that some Marxist indictments against religion had a ring of truth to them. Eaton had little patience for pious generalities such as, quote, when individual men are saved, then society will care for itself, end of quote. As he saw it, such statements offered little to those who had pressing needs of wages and bread and butter. According to Eaton, the many who were baffled and embittered by the evils of capitalism understood the language of daily toil, struggle, hardship, and comradeship for justice. In other regions of Canada, one could find clergy of mainstream denominations open to socialistic solutions. For example, a significant number of the United Church ministers believed that collectivism was a better solution than capitalism. So I had looked at the example of the Maritime Baptist, and the numbers there, it was it tended to be a minority who were adopting a more radical approach. But the United Church of Canada, which was formed in 1925, and this was uh, where we have the Methodist, Presbyterians, and Congregationalists joining together, uniting together to form this United Church. What, what we find with the United Church is um, tends to be a more, um, even, even more so than the Baptists and the Maritimes, uh, receptiveness to collectivism, to um, uh, more of a, yeah, a social gospel approach in uh, focusing on some, you know, worldly, worldly problems and less, uh, less attention to, you know, issues of sin and, sin and salvation. The debate concerning capitalism was one heard in many circles. Most politicians were cautious concerning reforms. Prime Minister King, who returned to power in 1935, was against extending the role of the government. So he tended to be more traditional in his economic thinking. Other politicians demanded more government action. And one example of uh, another party was formed. I mentioned William Aberhurst with the Soldier Credit, but there was also the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. Uh, the Cooperation Commonwealth Federation, better known with the acronym CCF, they supported some form of socialism. This party had its beginnings at a national convention in, in Calgary, Alberta in 1932. The Labour Member of Parliament, J.S. Uh, Woodsworth, he became the leader of this, this new burgeoning political party, the CCF. He recruited left-wing intellectuals to draft a manifesto for the party. Known as the Regina Manifesto, it set out a 10-point program to see, for the most part, the eradication of capitalism. Do uh, a key 
was for the government to nationalize the means of production, distribution, and exchange. The, in the federal election, so three years later after it, after it, it emerged, the CCF won only seven seats. And so at least at this stage in Canadian history, Canadian voters were not ready for a socialist government. When the CCF became the new Democratic Party, and, and of course, the, this is the NDP, today's NDP, uh, NDP uh, new de the, the new Democratic Party, we see that the NDP does much better pro both provincially and federally. The Democrat Socialists, for example, had, ended up forming uh, governments in six provinces, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Ontario, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and Alberta. Well, returning to 1935, after 1935, the liberal government was unsure of the best economic approach. Prime Minister King, now he again, he, he won the election in 1935. So R.B. Bennett was prime minister for five years from 1930 to 1935. And King returns as prime minister. Of course, he had been prime minister since the early 1920s up to 1930. He returns as prime minister and he wrote to the president of the Bank of, of Montreal stating, quote, my own view is that the most effective means of ending the drain of relief expenditures on our financial resources and of making bearable the burdens of existing debt is to be found in the revival of trade, end of quote. And so actually what we see is that King's finance minister Charles Dunning, he negotiated a low tariff agreements with the United States and Britain. So Dunning was again more, you know, traditional, more lazy, fair-minded, you know, more aligned with uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King. To ensure that provincial governments use relief money wisely, Prime Minister King set up a National Employment Commission to e re-examine and restructure the administration of direct relief. The commission's final report was for the federal government to assume full responsibility of unemployment payments. Provincial and municipal governments had shouldered the task now the commission wants to see the federal government taking this over. Also the commission recommended deficit financing. This new approach favored a quote, policy under which public expenditures might be expanded and contracted to offset flux fluctuations in private expenditures, end quote. So here, we have uh, kind of a foreshadowing of Keynesianism. And this is uh, the beginning of a time where we, we have the, the rise of the Canadian bureaucrats and civil servants who are begin to take a larger role in, in, in seeing uh, policy played out in, in Canada. Now taking a cautious approach, Prime Minister King rejected any added uh, federal responsibility, but there were others in his cabinet that wanted to see more, you know, more progressive thinking. Norman Rogers, who was the Minister of Labor, he supported the idea of increasing government expenditures and felt that a balanced budget should not be the most important issue. Getting uh, uh, Charles Dunning, uh, again, he had said 
came up with good uh, talks with the Americans in reducing the tariff. Dunning wanted to keep the deficit to a minimum and he opposed Rogers. So he's more traditional. Rogers is more in, in you know, Keynesian. Both threatened to resign if their individual proposals were not implemented. So there's a bit of a power play there. Uh, and again, things were complicated because the cabinet were kind of split on this issue too. Eventually a compromise was worked out and, and so we have uh, something worked out for a, a recovery program. The traditional thinking King was reluctant to change, but he never quote, forget, forgot, he never forgot that leader and party like rider and horse must always go at the same speed in the same direction, end of quote. King did not become a Keynesian, but there were clear signs that the liberals were moving in that direction. The later 1930s saw some improvement, but the 1937-1938 slump reminded Canadians of the fragile nature of the economy. In the end, full economic recovery in Canada would have to wait until early in the 1940s. And that last slide, just looking at the unemployment rates. And here we see that, uh, you know, things are slowly getting better. The numbers, 19, 1936, it drops down to 12.8 from 14.2 and 37, a, a, even a better decline, a drop down to 9.1, but look at 1938, look at 1939, jumps up again. And we only, uh, the unemployment rate only gets to below 5%. It, that takes until 1941. So the Canadian experience kind of echoed the, or sorry, yeah, the Canadian experience echoed what took place in the United States and the, the numbers just are not good. The, the policy decisions that were made in both countries did not result in the recovery that many had hoped for. Thank you.